time to start our singing. I think it is. Yes, it is. Please join us in singing if you'd like. Open my eyes that I may see Glimpses of truth you had for me Place in my hands the wonderful key That shall unlock and set me free Silently now I wait for you Ready my God Good morning. Good morning. The attendance pads are on the street side of the sanctuary. Please pick those up, sign your name, and pass them across. Prayer cards today, um, we're going to uh, fill those out if you have prayer requests or praises. They're in the pew racks in front of you, and during the praise songs, they will be collected, so pass them over to the aisles when you're finished. You have an insert in your bulletin. I'd like for you to take it out, and let's take a quick look at it. It's our financial picture at the end of September. Okay? Now, uh, it shows we are $17,000 in the hole. But if you're looking at last month's, last month we were 19000 in the hole. So we crept up a little bit in September. And hopefully October has helped us reduce that deficit a little bit more. At the bottom of that insert are some dates that you need to mark on your calendar. Um, lots of things coming up, and we need to save the time now. It's filling up, so don't miss out on what's happening at church. Tomorrow we'll be watching The Chosen at 6.30 in Fellowship Hall. We're on session five, so come join us for that. We have one birthday this week. Uh, Sherry Foley has a birthday this week. <clears throat> She's unable to worship with us for health reasons, but I'm sure she would enjoy a birthday card. So let's celebrate her birthday with cards. Pastor Bob will call us to worship. Good morning, church. Good morning, Pastor Bob. 
It's a beautiful day, isn't it? It's beautiful outside, but it's beautiful inside. For the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, is alive. And his spirit is here with us to worship him. I'm going to pray and let us pray together that we would welcome God to do a new thing as we come to worship in our call to worship. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you for the opportunity we had to gather together as a community of faith so that we can worship you together and so that we can enjoy your presence and we can applaud your glory. In Jesus' name, we invite you to come and do something new this worship service. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Please stand and join us with the first hymn. We talk about the Lord being our vision, and we also need to look at him as our Savior. And like uh, sheep that have gone astray, all of us have gone astray. This next, uh, next song talks about a prayer that Savior, like a shepherd, lead us. Jesus, 
Good morning. If you're confused, I'm not Rod. But we, we just, we're just kind of switching things around. Anyway, it's all about stewardship this morning. And, you know, they usually print out a list. You know, th this is my checkbook. This is my credit. You know, this is where I spend my money. So these must be the things I appreciate. I thought you'd rather see a slideshow. <laughs> There's no music, uh, nothing. We really enjoy Christmas. We really enjoy Christmas. Uh, we do cantatas. We do Easter programs. Um, we love Easter. The lilies are just fantastic. Um, we have Bible studies. We have a men's Bible study. We have women to women. Thank you, Cheryl. And we support. We, we reach out into the community. This is Front Porch up at Cal Poly, uh, Lesotho, the Orphanage in Africa, Life Water, thanks to Rod. And we even have a praise team. Aren't they fantastic? We, we are a very busy church, and we reach out into our community. We spent about $10,000 every year going to a dozen different charity groups with outside of the country and even in the country, even in our own community. We have special programs such as Hanging the Greens and a Christmas program during Advent, an Easter program, 2024 Summerfest, and we've invigorated the handball choir. They're just, they're really good. They're fantastic. This year, we did an all-encompassing musical titled Celebrate Life, thanks to Donna. And Steve. And, you. and Steve. Well, a lot of people. Yeah, a lot of people. Along with practices and singing during worship service, the praise team has been known to give personal concerts at homes of the congregation members who are housebound. Our church in the park every Sunday brings God's word and love to people of our community who would never, ever think of setting foot in a sanctuary. This fall, we instituted a pop-up worship in various locations across Santa Paula, spreading God's word and love. Thank you, Ron. He's the one that's pushing that. Every Wednesday afternoon, we support the Spirit of Santa Paula Food Pantry. We support AA meetings and support Sunday services for the Church of the Revival. And we find time for normal church stuff, like the Bible study, Women to Women, and Friday afternoon prayer group. We even have regular Sunday services here. We are a very, very busy family. 
Please remember as you pray and complete your pledge cards that it takes a combination of time, talent, and funds to keep us reaching out into our community. And we cannot do it without your help. Thank you. Along the lines of stewardship, I want to uh, give you a verse of courage because sometimes it's uh, a little scary to give to, to the Lord's work, to sow seed into the Lord's, the Lord's work. So I want to read to you 1 Corinthians 9, 1 I believe this passage is designed to encourage people not to be afraid to give, to be assured that it's actually the opposite, that instead of losing out or getting behind, that when you give, you actually, in different ways, primarily spiritually, get ahead. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, 1 to 15. So you get a micro sermon and a regular sermon today, two for one special. But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully, plants bountifully, will also reap bountifully. In other words, harvest bountifully. Let each one give as he purposes. That's why we do uh, stewardship season and people make pledges so they could pre pre pre-plan what they're going to give, so it's not grudgingly. So let each one give as he proposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity. That's why we don't get up here on Sundays. You know, many churches, the pastor gets up on Sundays and encourages people to give. It turns into a little dentist session where teeth are being pulled out of the church. We don't do that because we want to do it once a year so you can pre-plan and pray about what God is going to have you give the coming year. And what happens? It says, um, and God is able to make all grace. In this passage, there's about four alls and a lot of every. So God wants us to know that he's going to fill us with the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, fill us with the Spirit, fill us with salvation, and in some cases, even fill you with more financial seed so that you can keep sowing. That's God's plan for some, that as they sow seed, he increases their ability to keep on keeping on. How many of you want to keep on keeping on financially? God has that for some of you. And God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that you always, having all sufficiency in all things, man, there's a lot of abundance for grace, may have an abundance for every good work, every good work. So... It's just not financially here. It's growing in Christ, abounding in Christ, abounding in the fruits of the Spirit. But no matter how God sovereignly chooses to make you abound, abundance is coming. Whether it's an abundance of salvation, an abundance of joy, abundance of shalom, an abundance of security, confidence. There's just abundance coming. That's the result of a heart that freely gives. Um, some people on TV make a big error. And causing God's people to give with the, with the uh, motive to get financially. Because that's not always true. But you're going to get something. You're going to get grace, joy, peace. It's just the, the, the fruit of giving is abundance. Jesus said, give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together. It would be a big error to say that give to get financially. That's horrible, right? Can I get an amen on that? But not to... But, but, but not to Mention the law of reciprocity, that God gives and gives, and he gives for all situations, all kinds of grace, all kinds of junctures in the road. His heart is just to give. He is dispersed abroad. That's his character. He's a giver. He's, he's El Shaddai, which means El Mighty One. He's not El Chipo. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. Now may he, may he who supplies seed to the sower, because that's what he does, and bread for food, supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness while you are enriched in everything. God wants to enrich your whole life for all liberality so that you can be a giver, a giver of prayers, a giver of time, a giver of witnessing, a giver of uh, counseling. I mean... God's just an abundant, abundant giver, and he wants us to, to be givers as well. And he says, I could make you abound in grace, ability, and for every situation. For the administration of this service not only supplies the needs of the saints, but also is abounding. 
Do you notice there's a lot of abounding, a lot of all, a lot of everything here? That should be our paradigm. God, a much, much more. Abounding through many thanksgiving to God. Now he talks about a spiritual economy. Well, through the proof of this ministry, they glorify God for all the obedience of your confession to the gospel of Christ and for your liberal sharing with them and with all people. Men, and by their prayer for you, who long for you because of the exceeding, there's a more abundance again, exceeding grace of God in you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift, a spiritual economy where a city takes notice that a church exists because it's always open to give, to serve, to be a witness. And God is saying this is an indescribable gift when people around you take note there's a church that's willing to be extrovert, to give, to share, and it creates a spiritual economy where people are grateful, they begin to pray for you, and there's kind of like an abundance of God's grace as, as people, as the church is praying, who can we give to? And then the people who receive pray for the church, and it becomes exponential where the church becomes a blessing and a light on a hill. Who wants to be that church? Amen. All right. God bless you as you think about what God wants you to give this season. Oh, and we're going to receive a member. Can we have Brenda come today? It's baseball day. Let's go, Brenda. Let's go, Brenda. Uh, do you have faith the Dodgers can win tonight to go to the World Series? They need a, I'm going to let you cheat. Pray for them. I never pray for baseball, but they need it. Brenda, do you confess that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior? In your own life, will you renounce evil and seek to obey Jesus Christ? Yes. Will you seek to love your neighbor as yourself? Yes. And church, will you stretch out your hand towards Brenda? Will you encourage, pray for, and support Brenda in her walk with you? Will you? Yes. Amen. Lord God, Fill Brenda in a new way with your Holy Spirit. Let all grace abound. And as she grows here at First Pres, gift her and empower her to cause others to grow. And let exponential grace be the result. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I have a membership certificate that I'll walk over to you in a few moments. But welcome. Give her a round of applause. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. We're going to take some time to pray. And one will be praying for those that are in need. But let's take some time to be silent before our God, to close your eyes. One of the things that the Lord asks of us before we go to communion, but I believe in all ways that when we come to serve him, that we need to examine our hearts before him. So let's take some time to be still, allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you, and in your hearts acknowledge ways that perhaps you have gone adrift in your own life, and ask God to meet you in that and to forgive you because of his grace. When Jesus went to the cross, his last words are, it is finished. Because of Christ on the cross, we receive forgiveness. His blood is poured out upon us. 
to forgive and give us new mercies and new grace each morning. And so receive that grace and believe in the promise that he forgives all who come to him and declare him Lord. Father God, we praise you that you are alive in us today. Lord, we lift up areas of our lives and we commit them all to you, our families, our friends. Lord, we love them and we pray that you would do a new and fresh thing in their lives, Lord. And in this world, in this country, in this city, and in our homes, may you be lifted up and glorified. Lord, we lift up Brenda this morning. We pray for encouragement, that she would experience that encouragement that you can give. And may she know that you are walking with her. Lord, we pray that you would do a new thing in our lives as a result of knowing you, depending on you, believing in you. And we can, because of Jesus Christ, bring all those things to you. For he says to come, and so we come. And we pray the way our Lord Jesus prayed. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, that we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. All right, today we return to the Gospel of Luke. And today we find ourselves in chapter 5. But to be sure, come Advent, we're going to reverse all the way back to chapter 1. Because we skipped the first couple of chapters, saving that for Advent, since it has to do with the Advent uh, narrative. Let's read the Word of God. Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. And today I want to speak to you how Jesus wants to get into your boat and help you become a catcher. One day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gethsemane, the people were crowding around him and listening to the Word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little while from the shore. And he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, We've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell He fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, I'm a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee. Parentheses, they were also fishermen. Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. So they pulled their nets and boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. The first thing I want to bring out here is that this story is mostly about Jesus calling some of his apostles, particularly Simon, who will later be Peter. That's what it's mostly about. But I'm amazed that God put so many extras where Jesus could have just showed up and said, Hey, what's going on, uh, Simon? 
and talked to him and then said, I want you guys to follow me. By the way, I have big plans for you, Simon. But why did Jesus make a big to-do with so many extra frills when he simply could have given an irresistible call? Any moderate or hardcore Calvinist in the house? I'm a, mo a mo moderate or mild one myself. He could have just given him an irresistible call and, and it would have happened. Why all the extra frills? God is so good. I want to cover the extra frills. Again, I've already admitted that the thing is mostly about Simon Peter getting called. But I want to visit the frills today. Just certain things that kind of infer God's heart, infer his nature, his personality. Because he easily could have just said, Simon, you're my guy. And I'm sure Simon would have responded. But, but, but God is so good that he goes above and beyond and just does things that kind of give you glimpses into his personality, into his heart, through his son, Jesus Christ, who's the exact representation of who the Father is. The first thing we see here, or I, that I want to bring out anyway, is that Jesus wants to get into your boat and catch you by teaching you the word of God. Simon, Jesus chose to get into Simon's boat. The boat's personal. Some of you would get kind of nervous if someone got into your boat. I'm using boat as a metaphor for your life, your business. How many don't want people up in your business? Particularly where you make your moolah. And if you're retired, you still don't want people driving around in your car unless you know they're really good or up in your house or up in your affairs. Jesus decides to get into Simon's boat. He cares. He mostly cared about Simon becoming an apostle. But he also cares about boats, he cares about your life, the intricacies of your life. So he gets into Simon's personal space. He could have easily taught from the shore. He could have found a rock. But he gets into Simon's boat, right into his personal business. Simon's not even there. Jesus was bold. Simon's out bending his nets, and Jesus still got into his boat. There's no mention of asking for permission to get into his boat. He just gets in there. Jesus wants to get into our boat. He's Indeed, he's moved already inside of your boat. And he wants to teach me and teach you every day the deep, deep truths of the gospel. The gospel is not for beginners. The gospel is for every single day. Because every single day, this world will try to tell you that God is not deeply entrenched in your life, that you're not loved, that you're not exceptional, that you're not accepted as you are, that you're not important unless you achieve and have this and drive that and do that and accomplish this. Every day we need the gospel. Every doctor's visit, every time you're facing a bill, every time you're facing a weakness that just seems to have followed you from the time you were young. We need the gospel every day. The gospel is awesome. In the gospel, Jesus said, you're not perfect. I am. I'll live a perfect life for you. I died for you, so there's no punishment, only blessing over your head. I live inside of you by the Holy Spirit. I'm going to give you power to love people you can't love, to keep on keeping on when you want to tap out, to grow in Christ-likeness because you can't do that on your own. I'm going to put fruit in your spirit fruit of the spirit in your life. I need the gospel every single day. And believe it or not, you need the gospel every single day. The gospel is not for beginners. If we master the gospel, it'll encourage you in every single thing you go through. Your baptism, the font says you belong to a family. You don't need to get caught up in identity politics or the color of your skin. You belong to God's family. It's the gospel. You're not your own. You've been bought with a price. That informs me when I'm in Santa Paula, when I'm out of Santa Paula, there's always this reminder, I belong to God. That informs my recreation. It informs uh, how I speak, how we spend, what we do. I, we need the gospel all the time. You are loved. You have joy inside of you. You don't need to shop for joy. You don't need to inject joy. You don't need to fake joy. You have joy. The gospel is so wide and deep. I don't have time to, to, to unpack it, but the gospel is what we need. And Jesus wants to be in your boat, in your business, literally and metaphorically. All the stuff that has to do with you, your mind, your heart, your body, your marriage, your parenting, your retirement, your future, 
We need the gospel and we do best to say, get right into the ship of my life and be the captain. Be the captain of my boat. You're welcome in my boat. Thy kingdom come, be the king of this boat. Let your will be done. Let this boat be the GPS where it's supposed to go. Thy kingdom come, your will be done. You gonna let Jesus be the captain? Let's read Matthew 13, 47 to 49. Jesus said a couple of other things about boats and fishing. Because later on, he's going to tell Peter he's going to be a fisherman. Again, but my point right here is that Jesus wants to catch people. He wants to catch people. He wants to catch your neighbor. He wants to catch your family members. He wants to catch us. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a fishing net that was thrown into the water and caught fish of every kind. When the net was full, oh, by the way, darn it, fish of every kind, I fell short of a Sierra Slam. I got a rainbow, a cutthroat, but didn't get the brown on this trip. We call that a Sierra Slam. Anyway, it says fish of every kind. When the net was full, they dragged it up onto the shore, sat down and sorted the good fish into the crates, but threw the bad ones away. That is the way it will be at the end of the world. The angels will come and separate the wicked people from the righteous. So how many know it's important to get caught? (laughs) It's important to get caught. It's important to let God make me a trout, not a carp. No offense to people that like catfish or carp. Jesus wants to get into your boat and my boat and call and ordain you to be a catcher of people. He wants to make you a catcher of people. Some people say, yeah, but I'm not called. I'm not, I don't have the gift to speak. I don't have the gift definitely to preach. I'm not, I don't have the gift to go up publicly and share with people. Yeah, but there's so many different ways. And there's a specific part of the harvest net or the fish catching net for you. And it's not all public. God calls both extroverts and introverts to identify their part of the net and to be involved in catching. And all of you are in many ways. Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. And they called their partners. They called some deacons. They called some elders, so to speak. Come and help us, John and uh, what was the other? Zebedee, they were the sons of Zebedee with John and who? James, come help us. Jesus cares about the harvest, the cats, the commission. He said things like pray that the Father will send labors into his harvest field. We need all kinds of different types of gifts to hold their part of the net. We need musicians, we need singers, we need social media people. We need carpenters and constructions. Rod can't be the only one hanging uh, off the building up there every five years. We need finance type of people. We need prayer warriors. We need Sunday school teachers. We need people that will take missions trips. We need people that are spiritually entrepreneurs to get out there and shake and bake for Jesus. We need all kinds of people. And so every single one of us, because Jesus cares about the harvest, is called to grab some portion of the net and be a catcher. Are you open to being a catcher? Some people are catchers by simply praying for people. Other people are catchers by just being nice and smiley and showing that they've been caught. There's different ways to be a catcher, but God has called all of us to be a catcher. Don't scare the fish away. If you're not, if you're not gonna catch, but okay, well, you know, I can't, I can't do nothing about that, but don't scare the fish away. Nothing worse than to be out there on a pristine lake and some bunch of young guys smoking weed come by on another boat with like rap music, boom, boom. I've been there. <laughs> They're sending reverberations throughout the lake and every trout in the lake is just, shoo, went to the other side of the lake because these guys are just out there for a joy cruise or something and you're sitting there stocking uh, trout. So don't scare the trout away, the fish away. By the way we behave, the way we live, con- being cantankerous, etc. So a minimum, even if we decide, well, I'm not ready to hold my part of the net. Cool. Just don't be scary. We want, Jesus cares about catching. 
And lastly, because I have to preach three different sermons today. Oh, no, I've got to preach three times, two different sermons. I'm hoping to end soon. I'm, uh, I'm going to be brief on purpose. Jesus wants to get into your boat, my boat, because he cares about your boat and wants to bless it. Verse 6, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. Young people would say, that's a little much, or you're much. When someone has a, a flamboyant style about them, or they're kind of obtuse, young people will say, you're a bit much. So if a young person tells you you're a bit much, it's not a compliment. If your grandchildren tell you, you're a bit much. They're saying, like, you're a lot to handle. Jesus decides to be a bit much. Because, again, he could have just called Peter. Or he could have sat down, shared with him over some bread, explained things to him, and said, and you're going to be my head guy. But he does it in a way that's awesome. He blesses the heck out of their boats and gives them an extravagant catch, so much so that the boats are like ready to go down, and they need to call other people. It's like a big to-do. That's a picture of what salvation is. We don't know it, but salvation is huge. It's weighty. It's like, like we don't know how much God has blessed us in Christ, what, how, how privileged we are, how enriched we are to have God, to have the, to, to have the privilege. You're my papa. I have everlasting life. And you fill me with the fruits of the Spirit. When the old stinking fruits of my life come out, you replace them with the fruits of the Spirit. And in life, there might be occasions where God visits you like that and just blesses the heck out of your boat. I don't know about you, my boat has been blessed. That doesn't mean that your boat's not going to go through storms. Because there's two other stories about boats, at least two other, well, there's many stories, actually. One in particular... The, 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 they're scared in the boat, and Jesus, after spending all night in prayer, walks on the water, and they think he's a ghost. Um, and he tells them, no, it's me, and they're okay. Then there's another story where they're in a storm, and Jesus is asleep in the boat. And he gets up, and he tells the wind to stop, and there's a mega calm. And then there's the Apostle Paul, who's on his way, doing God's missionary work, and the ship totally sinks in the Mediterranean Sea, and they're, they're certain they're going to die. So, Jesus, be, God cares about your boat. Jesus cares about your boat. And even though there might be times where you think there's ghosts, bad things that are happening, you might get superstitious, things get rocky in storms, Jesus is in the boat, and he cares about your boat, and he's going to bless your boat. Just live with joy and confidence knowing that Jesus is in your ship. And if he's in the ship, even if it looks like it's going to sink, it's not. You are loved perfectly by God. Jesus even said, you are, whoever comes to me, you're in the palm of my hand, and nobody could pluck you out. So be confident that Jesus is the captain of your ship. You're in his boat. And there ain't nothing that's going to sink God's boat, right? Amen. Amen. We're in the best ark there is. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Holy Spirit, take this little feeble attempt of mine to explain this passage and fill us with faith and awe of who you are and in awe of the deep, deep love of Jesus. Amen. Please join me in the offertory prayer. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we dedicate these offerings to you. Help us to give with pure hearts, knowing that all that we possess is a gift from you. We ask that you use them to accomplish your will. Bless these offerings for their use 
in spreading the gospel and glorifying your name. Guide and direct us as your church to accomplish your will. We ask these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please stand and join us with doxology and sing praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him After that rousing message, how can we not decide to follow Jesus?
20 after. Or maybe I'm fast. You know, it, 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 was, it was short. He, he, was, he was shorter than normal. Much shorter. Sh much shorter than normal. Well, he does have three sermons today. Yeah. 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 So yeah. Wow. He went to get on the road. 